We continue today, dear listener, with this series of preliminary lessons on how to study the Bible. We've called this series of lessons, Guides for Understanding Scriptures, and we hope they'll be helpful and a blessing to you in your own study of God's Word. In today's study, we continue to consider the four major aspects of the Word of God, which are revelation, inspiration, illumination, and interpretation. These are very important aspects, and that's why we want to mention them again today, just to add a word or two as we progress, because the truth is we're dealing with a book that is under attack like no other book. On one occasion, Dr. McGifford, who is a great history professor, stated, There are probably few Protestant theologians today who treat the early chapters of Genesis as sober history. Statements like this could easily be multiplied endlessly. Dr. C. H. Dodd said, It has long been clear that in claiming for the Bible accuracy in science and history, its apologists had chosen to defend a hopeless position. The general conscience has been harmed by allowing the threadbare morality of portions of the Old Testament to be upheld as authoritative statements. Now let us tell you that these are very serious attacks and they can be multiplied today. In contrast, let us quote some very interesting statements because we are living in a time when divisions among supposed Christians simply do not fall along denominational lines. As early as 1902, a minister in the British cabinet made this statement. The old denominational lines are fading and becoming illusory. The true division that is emerging is between those who believe that the Bible is the word of God and those who do not. And that's where we are today. Personally, we feel offended by the statement made by some people that no intelligent person today believes in the Bible, and that no intelligent being could ever believe it. Let us quote from Gladstone, who is one of the greatest legal thinkers Britain has ever produced, what he says about the Bible. I speak of the questions of the day. There is but one question, and that is the gospel which can and will remedy everything. I am glad to say that almost all the leading men in Great Britain profess to be Christians. Now that was in 1902. But let us quote something else that Gladstone himself said. For 58 years I have been a public servant. I have spent all but 11 years in the British government cabinet. During those 47 years I have associated with 60 of the century's experts and all but 5 were Christians. This is a tremendous statement. We believe that part of the problem we have in the world today is that there are very few Christians who are in the top rank, and therefore there are very few who know the most important book in the world, which is the very Word of God. Now, Gladstone was not the only great man in world history who declared himself in favor of the Bible. Michael Faraday, one of the greatest scientific experimenters the world has ever seen, is still praised by men who add acid to the test tube and examine it under the microscope in today's laboratories. He was a genius, and he declared the following. Why should men go astray when they have this blessed book of God to guide them? And scientist Isaac Newton said, If the Bible is true, there will come days when men will travel at a speed of 50 miles per hour. And Voltaire, the skeptic of that time, replied, Poor Isaac. He was in his dotage when he made that prophecy. It only serves to show the effect that Bible study has on a scientific mind. We can see quite clearly the result. It proved Voltaire very wrong and showed him to be greatly overshadowed on many fronts in his attack against the Bible. And that Isaac Newton undoubtedly knew something that Voltaire did not. Yes, these are extraordinary statements that we have quoted here. And we could continue quoting many who believed in the Bible. But remember, we were talking about the revelation of the Bible, which means that God has spoken and communicated with man. Thus says the Lord, and similar expressions occur more than 2,500 times in the Bible. And then, we talked about the argument that the scriptures are fully and verbally inspired by God. We also mentioned that inspiration guarantees the revelation that God has given us. Some time ago, in 1933, Britain purchased the Codex Sinaiticus from the Russian government for the British Museum. At that time, about £100,000 was paid for the document, which is equivalent to half a million dollars. Speaking of manuscripts in Britain, the late George Kenyon, who was director and principal librarian of the British Museum, made the following statement. Thanks to these manuscripts, the ordinary reader of the Bible can feel confident about the purity of the text. Apart from a few minor verbal alterations that are considered natural in hand-transcribed books, we are confident that the New Testament has come down intact. Dear listener, that was one of the most important discoveries ever made. You can be sure today that we have something that is as close to the original autographs as anything else could be. 
So we can be completely confident that inspiration still guarantees the revelation we have. We believe that the autographs are inspired, and that's why we believe in verbal and plenary inspiration. Now when we talk about verbal and plenary inspiration, we want to clarify that the words are inspired. Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers said, The scriptures indeed are perfect because they are spoken by the word of God and by his spirit. Augustine on his part declared, Let us therefore submit and bow down to the authority of the holy scriptures which cannot err or deceive. Dear listener, we need to recognize this today. We have a book that is fully inspired, and as that great genius from Princeton said years ago, what the Bible says God says and he speaks to us through this book. Let's now consider the third aspect which is illumination. Illumination means that since you and I have a book, a divine book and a human book, written by men expressing their thoughts, only the Holy Spirit can teach it to us. While its authors wrote this book, they were actually writing the Word of God. Although we can acquire the facts of the Bible ourselves, it is the Spirit of God who must open our understanding and heart if we are to grasp the spiritual truth found within it. The marvelous thing about Scripture and its supernatural aspect is that God did not obliterate the personality of the men who wrote it. They wrote what was in their minds and hearts. But the Spirit of God guided them in such a way that many truly desired to understand the things they wrote about, but could not. Peter tells us in his first universal letter, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that the prophets searched and diligently inquired about the things they prophesied, trying to understand what they meant. These men wrote without error. For example, Moses himself made mistakes and wrote about those mistakes. But the notation of their errors contains no imperfection. Dear listener, this is a relationship that the Word of God gives us and through it we receive a revelation from God. Now, in light of the fact that this is the truth, we are faced with a book that requires more than just mental penetration to understand it. The Apostle Paul, writing his first letter to the Christians in Corinth in chapter 2 verses 7 to 9, makes this interesting statement. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, 9. Now dear listener, you and I acquire almost all of what we know today through one of these channels, the channel of sight, the channel of hearing, or through reason. Now Paul says here that there are actually certain things that the eye has not seen, and certain things that the ear has not heard. There are certain things that don't even manage to penetrate the mind. How then are we going to obtain them? The Apostle Paul continues to say in verse 10 of his first letter to the Corinthians chapter 2, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.10 Many have taken this verse to a funeral. The pastor says that the good brother so-and-so was a great man but didn't know much here on earth. But now that he's in heaven and reflecting with maturity, he knows things he never could before. Surely that's the truth. We believe we'll receive a unique education and we'll graduate when we get to heaven, but the verse isn't talking about that. Paul says that certain things we'll never be able to learn through ordinary means and that the Holy Spirit must be our teacher right now before death comes upon us. You'll recall that on the day of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, he was walking on the road to Emmaus and joined two men. He talked with them and asked, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They responded, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And the evangelist Luke, in chapter 24 of his gospel, verses 17 to 20, tells us, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Scene script. Notice in verse 19 it says, He was a prophet. That is, in the past, he was a prophet. As far as they knew, he was gone, yet he was there speaking with them. He had foretold that he would be condemned and crucified. 
Interestingly, the prophets had spoken of this many years before, so these men expressed a faint hope they once had, but now it seemed to be gone. And verse 21 continues. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. They kept recounting what they knew and what they had found when they left Jerusalem. Apparently, they didn't pay much attention to what the women had reported. Let's read verse 24. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Their hopes had dimmed and darkness filled their hearts. Now listen to what the Lord Jesus said according to verses 25 to 27 of chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Dear listener, wouldn't you have wanted to be there on that day to hear the voice of the Lord as he quoted, from the Old Testament, bringing to light the scriptures that referred to himself. And finally he revealed himself to them as they sat together at the dinner table. It's that when we feed on the word of God and on himself, then he reveals himself to us in all his glory. And this is the comment of the disciples in verse 32 of chapter 24 of the gospel, according to St. Luke. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Luke 24, 32. Dear listener, we are studying a book that is unlike any other book. It's not just that I believe in the inspiration of the Bible, I believe that this is a book closed, unless the Spirit of God opens your heart and mind to its true meaning. So we see that as Jesus walked with these disciples, he opened the scriptures to them. Then, when Jesus returned to Jerusalem that time, he continued teaching his disciples. And the evangelist Luke continues to narrate in verses 44 to 45 of chapter 24 of his gospel. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Luke 24, 44, 45. Let's pause for a moment and note that Jesus believed that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. He believed that the prophets spoke of him and that the Psalms pointed to him. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Dear listener, if he doesn't open your mind and mine, we won't understand them. That's why we must approach this book with great humility of mind no matter how intelligent we may be. We hope that right now some seminary graduates who presume to be wise without truly being so are listening. Well, we all go through this period. But I have learned that there are one or two things that I didn't know. And Luke continues with verses 46 to 48 saying, So it is written, and so it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Now note how they are going to be witnesses, they will have help, indeed they will have a lot of help. In verse 49 we find this beautiful promise. Behold I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In other words, he says they would have a teacher to open the word of God to them so they could understand it. And we have the same teacher. Now let's go back to the first letter to the Corinthians, to continue reading the portion we quoted earlier. Paul writes in chapter 2 verses 13 and 14, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We are never disturbed when an unbeliever, even a preacher, says he no longer believes the Bible to be the Word of God. To tell the truth, he never believed it before. But that's the right way for him to speak because, after all, if he's not a believer, he can't understand it. He lacks the Spirit of God. For that reason, we quoted Bishop Hadley the other day when he said, There is more sense in every word of Holy Scripture than we shall ever be able to get out of it. Mark Twain, who wasn't saved, said, he wasn't disturbed by what he didn't understand of the Bible. What troubled him was what he could understand. 
There are things in the Bible that an unsaved person can understand, and those are the things that cause many to reject the Word of God. It was Pascal who said, we must understand human knowledge to love it, but we must love divine knowledge to understand it. It was Robert Alfred Vaughn who declared that these unbelievers are, in their vain rejection of the outward light until they have changed into darkness, the light within. That's what Paul meant when he said they did not receive the love of the truth, and for this reason God allowed them to believe a lie. Let us say, dear listener, that, although the unbeliever has spoken some harsh words about us, God has spoken even harsher words concerning unbelievers. We hope you understand, dear listener, that it is important for us to have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. In our next program, we will continue with more words concerning illumination, and then we will conclude with the fourth aspect we were considering regarding the Bible, namely, interpretation. We stop here for today because our time has concluded. We will visit you again in the continuation of this interesting study, and we hope you will tune in again. Thank you for your attention today, and may the Lord bless you is our fervent prayer.